Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tammy Chucky Show. It's good to see you. So this evening, we're going to have a little fun. We're kind of going to go back in time since it was the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World. And to kind of set us in the mood, I thought I'd play a little clip. So here's a little clip to get us started with our interview this evening. So Walt Disney World, as you saw towards the end of that clip, there was a monorail, actually two of them riding on by. So this evening, I am so excited to welcome the Walt Disney World opening crew for the monorail. So let's welcome them all. We have Tom, Robert, Bruce, Steve, Steve, and Ted. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi. <laughs> we lost Ted again. Uh-oh. Oh no, we haven't attended. We lost you. He'll, he'll come back. I'm sure he will join us again. Um, but what what was your initial reaction seeing those clips from 1971 of Walt Disney World? Just seemed like yesterday. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. We're, we're all a lot older and we're yeah. all a lot grayer. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's Ted. He's back. Yeah. Hi, Ted. Can you hear us now? Hello, Ted. <laughs> hey, Ted. Hey, Steve. Oh, I, I think we're getting a little yet. feedback from your um, from your computer. Do you have your headphones by chance? Okay. Well, I'm so glad you guys all decided to join us this evening. It's it's so exciting to have all of you here. And I, my first question was going to be, you know, how did you initially hear about this job, this this new job that came out and working for Walt Disney World? Well, I uh, was acting as a, not acting, I was a police officer for the city of Winter Park. And, uh, I can't hear it all. Go ahead. Go. And so I... Uh, heard on the TV that there was going to be some job interviews. So I decided just for the fun of it, go out and fill an application in. And uh, lo and behold, I got called in for an interview. And uh, they said that there was four things that they were interested in, which uh, parking lot, buses, monorail, and watercraft. And uh, I think think it was um, not Tom. Tom, who is your boss? Uh, Pete Crimmings. Yeah, Pete. Pete uh, Crimmings um, said something about monorails. And anyway, I said, well, what's a monorail? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, sort of started off in the blind there. But uh, first monorail. Uh, I, had, I got hired, and that made me the very first monorail that got hired for Walt Disney World. Yeah, I, I interviewed two of these guys, uh, Bob Woodham and Bruce Fox. Yes, I hired you did. them personally. Uh, there was a, a, a little uh, area set up off of 535 and I-4 and a bunch of trailers, uh, which in turn uh, turned into... Uh, uh, a shopping center uh, later, but uh, 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 drive down there, and it was right around Johnny's Corner. Uh, and anybody that worked opening remembers Johnny's Corner because we would all stop there uh, to have a after dinner uh, drink <laughs> and an adult <laughs> beverage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I hired both Bruce. Bruce was the first one hired. Uh, I, Bob Woodham was number one, and then uh, Bruce was number two hired on the market. Yep. Now, uh, Bruce was working in uh, IBM. Uh, well, it was data processing. Yeah. 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 And, it was uh, a data, data uh, processing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Bruce, just like myself, had a little problem with his, his weight. And, I didn't uh, have problems with that. You did. 
<laughs> and, and I told him he wouldn't look real good in the costume unless he took off 20 pounds and Bruce took off 20 pounds so I hired him and there you go yeah those there costumes those costumes were one piece hey, and I think seat. everybody in California must have been five feet one and all of us guys that were over six feet it talked like this when you put it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so how, how was how was training done for the monorail prior to, you know, the park opening? How many months of training, or maybe one month, or maybe two weeks before the parks open? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, who wants to jump in? Uh, at, at, well, the monorail beam. Right. Yeah, monorail beam. Uh, uh, the actual track didn't get completed until almost just prior to the first test opening for uh, Labor Day area. And so we trained everybody on the spur line uh, from the from the shop out to the main line uh, and every ride in and out uh, with the new operator was a white knuckle ride uh, because the end of the spur line was a dead end. So uh, if if somebody oh, no. didn't hit the if somebody here. didn't hit the brakes, we'd have gone through the end of the uh, parking lot. I think we call that a gap more than a more than a dead end. That kind of sounds kind of. <coughs> but yeah, all of a sudden there was no more rail. But do you That's want any scary. background leading up to it? Yeah, it. Yeah, I, I lived on the coast. I didn't get to participate in Johnny's Corner because I had to go back and forth. So during the training process, when we weren't training or sleeping in the monorail waiting to, to do what we needed to do, I was traveling between Orlando and Merritt Island, which is over on the East Coast for those people watching that aren't familiar with the area. But uh, yeah, quite an experience driving back and forth to get here in, in fog and bugs. And, now, Tammy, you look at, you look at the group, and uh, uh, Bob and uh, Bruce uh, and myself stayed on and retired working for Walt Disney World. Steve went out to be a uh, 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 work with uh, uh, Delta Airlines uh, for a while, and uh, Ted, thirty-five uh, years, <laughs> and uh, and and Ted became a teacher. Uh, and so, uh, but we've, uh, we've all got together uh, periodically for some sort of uh, reunion or get together. Uh, and uh, there's a, a couple, couple guys. Uh, yeah, that uh, do an annual uh, get together of uh, Walt Disney World transportation. And I see most of these guys at that, uh, that get together. Robert, you're muted. Let's unmute you. There you go. Go ahead. Oh, hey, Fox. Hey. You you were lucky you got to drive home. I had to go out into the parking lot, park my car, and sleep in the car because I only had four hours before I had to get back online. <laughs> they were quick trips, wow. Bob. Quick trips. <laughs> four we hours? Asked... How did you do that? Good Lord. Well, here's a story for you. Tom Nabby worked so many hours when he finally took home, I think he went three days straight. He can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but he finally got to go home to take a shower. He fell asleep in the shower and what woke him up, all the hot water ran out and the cold water came oh. on. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was October 1st. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, 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 and the fog, the fog driving in was like pea soup. Uh, and I, yeah. I had read all sorts of weather reports on Florida, and, and nowhere did they talk about fog. But uh, boy, the fog settled in that morning, and uh, you could see the uh, 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 couldn't see past the hood of the car. Uh, but yeah, I fell asleep in the shower, and the cold water woke me up. <laughs> but oh but we all worked. We all worked long hours. Now the difference being is that uh, 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 Bob and and Bruce and Steve and Steve and Ted uh, were hourly, uh, and and uh, I was management 
Uh, so my pay stayed the same. The long hours they were working in, they were making a heck of a lot more money than I was making. Uh, but but in turn back then, back there, I think the starting starting wage for hourly was what uh, two oh five, I think. Two twelve. Okay. Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow. And we thought we were rich. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, so what was what was the feeling like during that time? I feel like there's so many stories I've heard is it, there it's a different mixed bag of emotions because this park was opening and Walt wasn't there to see it open and Roy his brother had been working this entire time to make this dream a reality and was there for opening day. So tell me about what you ca as cast members were feeling up to those days of before you officially opened. Well, I know that we started, uh, I started in July and with a handful of people, we trained in the monorail shop. And of course, as Tom was saying, taking the monorail with spur beam all the way up to the switches. And I just remember everything being so clean and new and fresh and uh, exciting that we were the start, you know, the start of something big being there in the beginning. Yeah, it Every was day. exciting. Every day was a new learning curve. We learned something new every day about the trains, uh, about the attendance, uh, of what, what we thought people in Florida uh, were going to do. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it was an experience and a half. And then we got to see a whole lot of uh, uh, entertainers and actors uh, because we carried them all from the hotels uh, into the park. So they rode the monorail uh, most of the time. So uh i i remember the uh opening night uh that we had uh bob hope uh and they had set up a temporary stage uh in the uh concourse of the uh, contemporary hotel and he got off on the opposite side of the train and uh and in turn he got off the train and he started his monologue and uh i heard on the radio uh you know uh, we can't hear Bob. Uh, turn <laughs> off those air conditioners. And so I made a management decision and pushed the uh, stop button on the uh, console in the Contemporary Hotel, which shut down all the power to the monorail. That was the only way I could turn the air conditioners off. And then I got on the phone and called uh, Ron Strickton, who is the superintendent in, uh, in the shop. And I said, Ron, you know, don't ask me why. Okay, he got about 10 minutes to get from the shop to the north rectifier and get ready to reset it so we can take Bob Hope back to his hotel at the Polynesian. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, he was there. Uh, yeah, Bob finished up his talk uh, and I uh, said, hey, throw the switch. And they turned the power back on and, uh, and the air conditioners came on and the train left the station and nobody was any wiser. Uh, to it, other than all the monorail people going, you did what? <laughs> well, I, I also remember those old air conditioners. Uh, they had big fans on the bottom of them, and it sounded like a fleet of bombers going over you. <laughs> but then they changed it to squirrel cages. They they upgraded the AC system a little bit, so well, they were a lot quieter. I remember why? Because, yeah. because every time you went into the contemporary hotel or the main main uh, 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 main gate complex or the Magic Kingdom, they all had a, a concrete base on it. Polynesian was open to the ground, and the 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 fans were mounted horizontal. Okay, so every time you went into the hotel, the fans would flex a little bit. Okay, and they kept flexing until the blade would break right. off and stick in the side curtain of the train. And uh, uh, that got rather exciting because you'd have to open up the side curtain. The switch to turn the air conditioning unit was above where the fans were. So you didn't know whether that was going to throw a blade off while you're in there trying to shut down the air conditioner. And that's why they had to uh, 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 re-engineer that. And they did one heck of a job. 
but there were several uh, things that went on that uh, uh, the uh, the differentials in the train. Uh, the monorails at Disneyland only traveled in basically one direction and very slow and reverse. The trains at, uh, at Walt Disney World travel in both directions. And uh, uh, there was a, a, a wrist pin in the differential that was starting to work out that it needed to be seated. And we had to tear every differential in all of the trains apart and, and re-machine uh, a wrist pin in there so, so it wouldn't come out and clip. It was clipping where the uh, main bearing uh, was in the differential of the train. Uh, the, the train itself is, is a uh, aircraft construction uh, honeycomb aluminum, uh, but all the drive units are GM and all the electrical components were uh, uh, General Electric. And uh, Bob Rur put those together and, and you could get bought almost everything that, that was on there off the shelf. Uh, and uh, that was sort of the interesting uh, part of it. Uh, but there was, boy, uh, uh, we, we learned real quick in the storms uh, that people wouldn't exit the station. Uh, and so we had to regroup how, how we entered people on the monorail <clears throat> in both the uh, 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 Magic Kingdom and uh, main entrance complex. Do you remember that, well, remember that, first, that, that first Labor Day when uh, all the employees, families were there? And the gates weren't up yet. The signs weren't up yet. In the middle of the afternoon, it started pouring, and everybody started coming up the exit ramps. And the and the cast members didn't know how to deal with that. And that was amazing. Nobody got uh, hurt badly in that. Well, uh, in in regards to that, what's interesting is you look at the platforms now in in, in the stations uh, as from main entrance and the Magic Kingdom. At that time, there were no permanent railings. It was just an open platform, flatbed, and you oh, had no. you had um, mobile stanchions, you know, basically with rope, and were extremely dependent on employees, employees that operated that monorail. Uh, I would have oh, to say, goodness. you know, the, con the concerns they have today about safety and so forth. I mean, the folks that open and the next crew in mm -hmm. basically lived it. Uh, lived lived on the edge, so to speak, mm -hmm. because a lot of the things that the monorail can do today and that the safety that was now built into the system, it was all uh, taken care of by people in the past. And yeah. I, the one thing I wanted to add to that is you got to, mm -hmm. I, I got to applaud the best, one of the best times of my life was working that monorail, but basically having the people. And I was, I was around 10 years older than the uh in the bulk of the crew and it was it was an interesting situation virtually every day it was something new but the the fact that you had people in that you could put people in the nose cone at that time so the operator uh was it had to be a pr person as well as a driver as being and also recognizing your what train you're in who's in front of you, who's in back of you. So you're monitoring the radio, which initially was always interesting because we were on the same radio frequency when we opened with 20,000 leagues under, leagues the, under sea. the sea. So <laughs> that, that made life very interesting when you were trying to communicate and say, you know, I'm in Monterey, so-and-so, and, you know, here I am. And you'd all of a sudden hear is 20,000 league uh, narration, the spiel being given by the operator of a 20,000 league sub. <laughs> and uh, you're trying to operate a system safely, and it, uh, it, it, I'm sure these oh, no. uh, gentlemen that are with us can probably relay some incidents that they that took place. But I applaud them, them and the other folks that aren't online with us. But then good. Hey, I want to. Hey, Bruce, I want to ask all of you guys. Do y'all remember uh, there was a painter at the Polynesian Hotel, and he was uh, painting underneath. The platform they had painted the top part but they had not painted underneath and so they gave him a ladder and he would get up on the ladder and be painting the bottom of the platform well 
when when driver. he was doing that, <laughs> he he would uh, poke his head up to see what was going on. So we went over and told him, hey, monorails are going to be coming through here real quick. And uh, what we'll do is blow the horn before we come into the poly. If you hear the horn blow, lower yourself down and the monorail won't, won't get to you. Well, the first one through blew the horn. What did he do? He looked up to see what was going on. Well, the monorail knocked him off his ladder. <laughs> so... Ooh. There should be a driver here that might know something about that. You think, Bob? <laughs> you know, how how many of you guys remember red flag, green flag at the Contemporary, oh, Contemporary. Contemporary Hotel? Yeah. The end of the Contemporary Hotel on each end, they were still finishing Boring off concrete. the stairways. And they were making cement pours. And uh, as uh, uh, Bob mentioned earlier, that the radio communication was rather uh, uh, a lot of traffic on it and uh, so it was real hard to understand what was going on so i got a got a couple uh, 20 foot ladders to put on each end of the building and we had a red flag on one end of, i had a red flag on one end and a green flag on the other and so when they went to, red to pour the cement the operator would wave the red flag and the train would stop outside the contemporary. Okay. Once the pour was done, then he wave a green flag and then the train could come in through the contemporary hotel. That's how primitive uh, the system <laughs> was. The same thing as the radio originally, you could transmit one time when you had a power failure. Okay. You could receive but you could only transmit one time and you had to be very precise on what you wanted to tell whoever you were talking to on, on what your breakdown was or what you needed because you weren't going to get a second chance. Yeah. Well, let me jump in here. We do have questions from the audience. First, I'd rather be in Walt Disney World says he loves your background, Tom. <laughs> oh, well, and that's also... my technical... Uh, my technical advisor said, you want all the junk in my office or do you want something in the background? And I told him, put a monorail in the background. Yeah. That's my it's son. Perfect. And he also yeah. said, this is so fascinating. I love all the behind the scenes stories. Ken says, so why, why were the Navi grabbers and were they useful at all? What does this mean? Uh, I have no clue. <laughs> I if think we want to tackle that, or I'll, I can I can handle it. But does anybody else want to tackle it? Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Let me try that one. Uh, okay. We people would drop things in the trough, oh, car keys, phone. Well, not phones at that time, but any personal items. And there were six hundred volts traveling through that that uh, line in there. And we were told under no circumstances were we to ever get into the trough. So the Navi grabbers were made of plastic and we would reach in there and get the items out that way. Yeah, what, I think that was, what, what I would think that happen? Was the case they, that, yeah, I think they that would was drop the everything that, except their kids uh, <laughs> down in the trough. And uh, I kept looking at the custodial people and they have the little picker uppers that you see. Okay, And so I took 12 of those uh, to the monorail shop and I said, look, extend these out to eight feet and there's 600 volts dc running through the bus bar so i don't want to electrocute anybody but the eyes of the shop extended them out uh and uh, uh because before what we'd have to do is we'd have to shut down the whole system and then somebody jump uh -huh. down in the trough retrieve what they had dropped and bring it back out well this way we could train would leave the station, reach down and grab it up and take it out. So uh, nobody knew what those mm. things were called. And uh, I think it was Randy Buss, uh, them, the, the Navi grabbers. And uh, <laughs> as true. people migrated off the monorail system, uh, it, it just got carried through those little picker uppers were called Navi grabbers. Love that. I remember, and anybody who's I remember, watching right now, make sure you can go ahead and chat in the YouTube comment chat chat section, and you can ask your questions live while we're while we're while we're going along. Uh, Luke has a question for Robert. Were you a narrator for any attractions? You have a great Disney voice. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> was that for me or Steve? Yes, yeah, you. That was for you, oh, Robert. Oh, okay. Um, well, they didn't pay me for my voice, so <laughs> maybe that... Maybe I should have done that as a second occupation. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a character, but he was never a voice character. You're right. <laughs> no, but I always had a voice. <laughs> well, you guys sent in some uh, some photos. So I thought I'd show some of them, and you can talk about it. Whoever sent them in, you can talk and give your story about each photo. So I think this one comes from Tom. So, Tom, yeah, tell the, us about this photo. Yeah, this is the opening crew. Uh Gentleman uh, to uh, to my right is Pete Cribbings, uh, one of the greatest managers you'd ever work for in your ter- entire life. Uh, the two other guys uh, the, on the far left is uh, Bill Cheney and Greg Emmer, and they both went on to uh, 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 retire from the company. Uh, Greg retired as uh, executive vice president uh, at Disneyland. Uh, many years later, uh, wow. uh, uh, Bill uh, stayed on. Uh, he worked for me when we built Epcot in Pico, which is a project installation. And when I uh, moved into warehousing for Walt Disney World overall, uh, Bill remained in Pico and uh, uh, did that through until he became uh, retired. Love this yeah. shot. Okay. That was a this? shot of all managers uh, that was yeah. from California. Yeah, that's so who is this? Uh, that looks that's like Ted. Ted. That's Ted. And uh, I know I started out as hourly and then got promoted to attraction supervisor. We didn't have to wear the uh, monkey suits anymore. But uh, these pictures are always good for laughs, seeing, <laughs> seeing what we had to wear, especially when it was hot. Yeah. Uh. That must have been fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how, like, what was the hottest that you've ever worked at at Disney? Do you remember wh- how hot it got? Because I know some dancers I've talked to who, who uh, were part of the Kids of the Kingdom said at some points it was so hot you could throw um, uh, um, an egg on, on the actual pavement and it would start to scramble. <laughs> well, it pretty was close to that. <laughs> I remember also when it got very cold, we got pea coats to wear and uh, th- those were those were very effective in keeping warm but as far as the heat goes i don't remember the exact temperature but uh yeah it was like definitely up in the 90s and then those thunderstorms would come rolling through in the summer and that really mm-hmm. that cooled things off those are scary a lot of uh, yeah well it, it, i don't know if everyone remembers this but as much gla- if you look at the picture behind tom that was like a sauna in there. If the air conditioning didn't work very well, uh, it was very, very uncomfortable in the cab of that Marl during the summertime. I can imagine. Did, did you guys, did you guys at the time, did they allow you to have people come and, and sit with you in the front of the monorail? Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a good yeah, one. Yeah, I remember they, one time they, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was in charge at, uh, well, they call the main entrance complex back back then, but I got a phone call. It says, oh, Monorail Green's coming down from the Contemporary, and uh, Walter Cronkite is um, walking up the exit ramp, but he and his family would like to ride in the in the front. And so I go down there to meet the monorail, and I was trying to explain, you know, well, maybe uh, if you guys could wait till the next train. But Mr. Cronkite, and his wife and his daughter were so gracious. He said, oh, no, 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 that's okay. Just go ahead. We'll catch the next train down. So just a little insight into the kind of person he was. Oh, I love that story. Yeah, that, and Robert, you were, you were yeah. holding something up, Robert, right? Was it one of these? Yeah. Uh, it's the wings that went on the uh, hats. Uh, that we wore during opening and they were these were ordered before uh, opening and they didn't show up on time Uh, Tom had a great idea if you look the second one was white that's actually uh, it's a piece of paper and uh, has glue on the back of it 
And he said, just take these and glue them on the front of the helmet until we get the ones above it uh, coming in from where we ordered them. So uh, for a while, those were the uh, emblems on the hats. And then the top one, which is uh, metal, got replaced later on. Very, very cool. Well, um, I'd rather be in uh, Walt Disney World says, do you still visit the Disney parks? And if so, which park is your favorite? Wow. Steve L, <laughs> you haven't really said too much. Why don't we let you answer yeah, a question? Yeah. I feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite park is uh, Epcot because it's... Uh, it's just a fun place to go and stroll. You don't have to ride everything, you know. You, you just go there yeah. and, and relax and have a few beers. And they serve and, booze. And they serve booze, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> of course, that don't matter to me. I mean. <laughs> Are you kidding me? But have you heard something? <laughs> Yeah, what anyway. country would I find? What country would I find you at, Steve L? If you could uh, just stay at one of the countries at Epcot, which one would you oh, be Germany. hanging around? Germany, that's my favorite. Yeah, and the food's good too. You know, they don't serve Bud Light in, in Germany, though, Steve. Well, they're going to if I have anything to do with it. <laughs> hey, I was going to tell you. You ask about how hot it gets. Well, after they kicked me off the monorail. <laughs> I was put out into the parking lot. Parking lot, yeah. Parking cars. Well, let me tell you something about that. This is back in 72 when they didn't have all these Air Jordan type tennis shoes. These sneakers and all. All they had was uh, Converse cheap little things. Uh, they just didn't have any protection. So when you're working in the parking lot in the summertime, you have to keep moving. It's like you got to dance all the time or your feet will burn through those oh. tennis shoes. That's how bad it was. So I got me some combat boots and started wearing those. <laughs> can I can I ask why they why they let you go from working at the monorail? Was oh, that, there's a there lot a of reasons. There? A lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Are we able to talk about it? Or we should I don't probably move so. on, shouldn't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, we'll we'll keep going. Uh, Ken says, "Did any of you ever walk the rail?" And if so, why? Uh, oh yeah, I, I remember. I remember opening day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I was at uh, Magic Kingdom Station, and Tom was bringing a monorail out from the shop, and uh, he radioed me to meet him at Monorail Orange or whatever it was. And I said, 10, 9, you want to walk out there? So I walked out on the beam, the interior beam, uh, all the way out to the switches. And we had a, the monorail pulled over. The door was open. And I hopped in, hopped into the monorail. And uh, Tom got out and walked out and walked the rails to Magic Kingdom Station made his call. And I manned the monorail yeah. to take the engine <laughs> power up. Yeah, I had things to do. Okay. Yeah. And and the we were waiting for the shop to come out and reset the rectifier and get the train going. And I remember uh, calling Ted and uh, say, hey, uh, walk walk out the beam and, and relieve me from Monreal Blue. Uh, and about <laughs> 10 minutes later, here comes Ted <laughs> shuttling, out, <laughs> shuttling out to the Monreal. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've walked the beam uh, uh, before opening quite a bit. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> Wasn't wow. there somebody walked all the way around up or walked all the way to the contemporary on the beam? I, I have a great story that I will share. Um, one evening at the contemporary, we were waiting on Josh Sledge to pick us up. It was like 3 a.m. in the morning, and we kept waiting and we kept calling him on the radio. No, Josh, no, Josh. And so the quickest way to the Magic Kingdom to get to the castle where we changed clothes was walking straight down the beam all the way down to the magic kingdom. And that's exactly what three of us did. <laughs> and oh. it was, it was an, an impressive. I will say that <laughs> 18 inches wide. 
Straight line, everybody. <laughs> I'd be yeah, scared. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you can walk to a, 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 a narrow uh, sidewalk, you can walk the beam to the monorail. The only thing you don't do is you want to follow somebody. You want to be number one. And if you're number two, you want to be far enough back that you don't see the person in front of you because their cadence changes uh, the, <laughs> the way you're looking. And it's rather scary. <laughs> doing that. Well, Luke asks, can each of you please say, please stand clear the doors or some <laughs> phrase that you used to say as a monorail operator? Okay, let me go with that. Folks, slide all the way over in your seat. Make room for everybody, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we keep them clean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The original trains had 44 doors, 22 on each side, and each yeah. of them had to be closed uh, individually. Okay, you push a button and they all open. But when the train got ready to go, you had to close each door individually. Uh, Holy and, cow. Uh, uh, in the Contemporary Hotel at two o'clock in the morning, uh, it was uh, very uncomfortable for those people that had their room on the fifth floor because they would be go bam, bang, bang, bang. bang. <laughs> <laughs> all, those, all those doors. And, Unfortunately, every once in a while, we would pinch somebody's uh, uh, legs. Uh, they would be scooted too close to the door. Uh, but uh, I remember, uh, the new, yeah, the but, new trains with the automatic doors are great. But and, and I don't know if anybody. Of course, I was driving most of the time. You guys were in management, but <laughs> every time we would come up and get guests on board the, um, the hotel side. They'd always ask where the monorail club car was. They want to go to the monorail club car, <laughs> which happened to be a bar in the contemporary. Contemporary, you're right. Yeah. Where's the dog? Well, I just wanted to put some footage to what most people have experienced before, obviously, but not everybody has gotten a chance to ride the monorail. Um, how about a fun question? Choose yeah, your fighter, good. contemporary, Grand Floridian, or Polynesian? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yeah. Contemporary Polynesian or Grand Floridian? Which one do you prefer out of the three? Well, the Grand Floridian came very late. Uh, yeah, temporary to me uh, remind me of a <laughs> somebody would blow a whistle and all the doors would open up. And everybody get out and walk down to their out of their cells and go downstairs. The <laughs> Polynesian had had at least some uh, atmosphere uh, that I really like, and they did a very good mai tai. Yeah. <laughs> and I miss all those uh, plastic trees in the lobby of the Contemporary. I always thought that looked kind of cool. Oh yeah. I forget. Yeah, there yeah. they are, right there. There they are. <laughs> yeah, the, that nose cone is the axle uh, for the first car. Is actually 14 feet uh, behind the front of the train. It's actually behind the operator. Okay, so you're cantilevered out over uh, the uh, the track, and the actual axle and tire that's holding that train up is behind you uh and then there are some uh, uh wheels on the side that hold it from going this way mm -hmm. did you notice all these uh photographs and pictures the trains are going different directions well that's for a reason because they used to go the same direction and people mm -hmm. Not me, but people were noted to race the monorails around the track so they all go in the same direction. <laughs> well, and, and remember also that we used to switch directions in the middle part of the day. You talk about some chaos. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's, but, that confused but, me. 
Which, yeah, but why do you go? Not the wear on the yeah. load tires, right? Is what it was. Yeah, yeah, but why we did that is because if you came in and you rode through the contemporary hotel coming in, great. Okay, but if you and and if we stayed in the same direction, okay, if you left, you didn't go through the contemporary hotel, and everybody wanted to ride through the contemporary hotel. So about four o'clock in the afternoon, when we start to get exit. Okay, we changed the direction to the train, so the train would leave the Magic Kingdom and go out and go through the Contemporary Hotel. Okay, if not, then the people would stay on the train and do a trip and a half. Okay, so that was a little bit of a problem uh, on on uh, uh, seats available, and we were rather restricted on the capacity to move people in and out of the park. Uh, for the first six months, uh, 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 we only had four monorails when we needed six. We only had two Osceola steamboats, six uh, launches, and a whole lot of trams who would break down halfway through the day. Uh, so yeah. about four o'clock every afternoon, we'd have an in-park count from the uh, duty manager and uh, uh, figure out how many people were left in the park and how long it would take us to uh, exit those folks on the theoretical capacity uh, on those uh, on those days, and if it <laughs> exceeded our theoretical capacity, uh, then they would extend the operating hours. And about six o'clock, there would be an announcement: "Come on, uh, you know, uh, folks, we have extended the operating day at Walt Disney World for another hour." Or another two hours because we needed that amount of time in order to get people out of the park. <clears throat> so, Robert, you've kept your log after all of these years. Yes, I have. It's the number <laughs> one log book for monorails. Um, we didn't have computers, so uh, we got uh, together. I think it might have been Cheney that actually came up with that. I don't remember who came up with it, but so we would yeah. put notes to each other uh, and supervisors would put notes in for everybody and the crew could put notes in for each other or whatever. And that's why we kept up with uh, things changing or some news that we wanted to get out to the employees because we didn't have computers. So. Yeah, well, the Paul log book Osterhout, came. who's one of the Imagineers, uh, who's who's worked on a couple of Disney attractions, he had he's in the chat room. He says, "Were any of you involved with the subsequent design decisions for the newer models, or asked about what was working or not working with the current design at the time?" We'd all moved on to bigger and better things. Yeah. Well, I was there longer than probably a lot of you guys. And, you know, the strobe lights, that came, that was a byproduct of that. Um, brighter, uh, brighter lights, uh, six train or six car trains. Uh, there was a lot of improvements, actually. Hey, yeah. Steve, on, on those uh, lights on the train, the whole story is that, um, what was his name? The, the guy that was in charge of opening the park and getting everything completed. Uh, Dick Nunes. Dick Nunes was having drinks up on top of the world with some executives from somewhere. And he looked out and said, hey, I'll point the monorails out to you as they go around the beam. Well, without strobe lights on the top, you couldn't see the monorails after they got out of the stations for a little way. So he called the shop supervisor and me to the contemporary and said, I want lights on the top of those monorails as soon as possible. Can we have them tomorrow? And uh, of course, the maintenance guy says, well, no, we can't have them tomorrow, but we'll get them on as quick as we can. And that's how that started, because Dick Nunes couldn't see them from the top of the contemporary as he was having a few uh, uh, adult beverages. <laughs> We have oh, another initially. question. Did, oh, did you enjoy that. guests riding up in the front with you when that was allowed? And any other good stories to relate to that? <laughs> yeah, fun fun time was uh, when we had the guests up there and they were 
fun to be along with and uh, talk and everything. If they were annoying, you some, I've heard of some operators with a perfectly straight face said, listen, you have to be quiet because I have to keep this thing on the rail. And that would often <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the, the thing about having guests in the front was that Ted had brought up earlier. Uh, I was lucky enough to be the driver for Walter Cronkite and his family. And that was that was a big dream of mine, you know, to have somebody with his uh, statue in my in my monorail with me. And at the end of the ride, I couldn't resist it. I said, "And that's the way it is on Tuesday, <laughs> June sixteenth, nineteen seventy-two." He got his daughter and his wife. With him. So that was pretty neat. Yeah. Hey, Steve Fox, L, I you... think I cut you off. Did I cut you off? What were you trying to say right before we got into that question? I'm sorry. Who me? I think it was Steve L. Right? Didn't? Were you? At, you were about to say something. No, no. I oh, I, it may have been me. I, when they were talking strobe lights, I can yeah, remember one of, the, one, of the, one of the issues with, with you. Basically, look at think of it in terms of a tail light, and you had a you got a train in the station in the Magic Kingdom. And, the, and the, there's a monorail on top of the hill that's trying to determine whether there's still a train in the station. And with all the lights down there, they're all white. They're all all the same as was the, the rear light or the tail light of the monorail. So you couldn't tell whether there was a train there or not. And it was, a, it was an ongoing complaint. And so the idea came up, there needs to be some kind of a changing pattern in that in the, on a monorail. Uh, so I, I know that had a part to play in the in, in the in the rear or the tail light uh, of the monorail, you know, so that somebody could see that there was one ahead of them, and what where it was. Well, well you remember thing. though on those the uh, the lights on the top uh, exterior was red and the hotel side lagoon was amber, and every light in the Magic Kingdom was amber. So you were absolutely right. You could It was a sea of lights when you were up on that hill trying to figure out if you could drive down. To, and, you know, you'd use your radio a lot, too. You'd call in for clearances and stuff like that. Hey, Boo. Yes, sir. Want to share with the folks the morning you went swimming at the poly? I, that's what I was trying to ask Bruce Fox because he's the oh, one. I was trying you. to be kind to you. I was trying to be <laughs> kind to you, Boo. I wasn't going to say anything about it. <laughs> but no, we were we were it was opening and it's it's dark when you uh, when you're getting everything together and we had to open the you, op, you go up and you check out the platform and open up essentially open up the the platform at the at the poly so I was driving and Bob was a passenger and he said I'll go upstairs and and take care of uh, getting getting it open so he I runs upstairs. And he comes back down. Now, I remember that those one piece costumes and, and that's a plastic hat he, we wore at that time. And so I see him come down and then he's, he starts toward me and all of a sudden he disappears. And I, and, and it was a little bit hard to tell, but then all of a sudden I see him again and he comes up what he had done. They were planting palm trees in, you know, in the area where the, where the stairwells come down. And they had left a hole and it was loaded with water. Well, Bob didn't see that. I mean, obviously. And he plunged <laughs> into that thing and, and it was hard. Yeah, well, I didn't. I, honestly, I didn't keep a straight face. It was not worth it. It was, it was a, a very comical picture of him basically disappearing. I see a hat bobbing and then I see Bob under the hat. And he comes up and he's just soaking wet. He's muddy. <laughs> and I, he, luckily he had a sense of humor and didn't haul off and hit me. But anyway, a great start. But yeah, I fell into a into an open hole that was uh, preparing to put a palm tree in out there. Yep, that was... Uh, were you were, okay, Bob? There were probably a lot of the... <laughs> Well, yeah, ego, every, every, physically I was okay, but my pride was hurt. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, Aww. you can't see it, but Bob's six, what, six, three, six, four. Six, four. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he think, totally oh disappeared into this hole. Oh, my. That, that, that's even more scarier. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, uh, so 
my my dad's also in the comments section and he says tammy and our family rode up a number of times in in the front of the you know of the monorail and we we miss it dearly you know what i mean um they took that option away i think almost like 15 years ago and i found a clip from our home videos from the year 2000 and um you'll see little me little four-year-old five-year-old me and um this is right around the, the time that they were bulldozing horizons so we kind of go right by horizons and you see that it's it's no more so here's just a little clip stay clear of the doors hi they will be closing in a moment hello this is our first time riding up front yeah ours too <laughs> so we've been here four years and you'll be like the million person <laughs> here we go keep looking at funny old videos on tv and see if i'll find up on this thing right here it's a magic kingdom <laughs> <laughs> Just another cool clip when the Millennium Celebration was happening. Yeah. And that was just really, that was like the most exciting part. You know, and you guys got that view almost every day, that beautiful view of just coming up to the Epcot ball, which was just amazing. So I, I miss it dearly. <laughs> well, the interesting thing, the spiels were live then, as I was saying way back when, that that's, you know, from an operator standpoint, there was a lot more expected out of an operator then than than it is now obviously it's simply yeah. and and to be able to have made that made it made a good world happen during that period of time uh, like i said you just i don't think anybody realizes just how competent uh these folks were that were operating those trains or those monorails at that particular time because it uh it, it there was a lot of skill applied to you're not just operating. In other words, everything everything is manual, and you had things that you had to be aware of, and buttons to push, and switches to switch, and you know, so that you could operate as well as do the spiel and be a pleasant pleasant operator as well. So, uh, and then get out on the platform and try to think in terms of how do we keep people from falling in, and when the 600 oh volt gosh. rail, you know, at, at, at that trough they're talking about in the station. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, there's a lot of things that. Uh, like I said, there were some good good folks at that particular time. I'm sure they're good folks today, but I don't think anybody realized just how many things they were involved with to make it happen and uh, to make yeah. to make it a pleasant journey for for the people that came into the parks. Well, yeah, Noah Tammy, asks, you, what were what were your guys' first thoughts on the monorail? Did you think it was as fut futuristic when you heard about it for the first time? Yeah, it seemed well, like I'm a I'm a country boy. I was born up in uh, Popka, Florida, and uh, uh, something like like when they said I was going to be hired as a monorail pilot, I had no idea what the heck it was. So it was <laughs> a lot of fun, a lot of excitement, and uh, something I'm so glad that I went through. You know, Tammy asked uh, earlier about the the heat and the temperature in the in the summertime. In the winter time, it was <laughs> cold in those stations, and those polyester costumes uh, didn't contain a whole lot of a lot of heat. And uh, uh, going in and out of the Contemporary Hotel, I remember a general manager a couple times calling me and wanting we had some uh, doors up there, and he wanted to shut the doors. And I, I basically said, "You shut the doors, you cut off your transportation." Uh, but, uh, yeah, it got real cold, uh, and there was no place to get out of the wind on the, uh, on the station. So, uh, those operators endured a whole lot of cold weather also. And I just say one of the magic things about it, there was, uh, one phase where, where, uh, there weren't enough spots in the monorail shop. And so we had to shuffle the monorails in and out and basically keep the state power on the stations till about three in the morning with just a, mm. a skeleton crew. And I remember when that was all finished about three o'clock walking down main street back, uh, back behind the Pinocchio restaurant downstairs when we still had costumes 
and all the lights were on, music was playing, the uh, cleanup crew had been hosing everything down, so everything was wet, and uh, just nobody in the park. It was just really, uh, really, really magical type feeling. Also, there would often be armadillos and possums in the uh, flower beds <laughs> on the ramps going down from the Magic Kingdom station. And imagine where those critters were during the day. I don't know, but uh, they sure came out at night. Well, and another another interesting experience that I had, getting off the, at work, as you said, Ted, about 3 a.m., and you're walking through Main Street, you don't take the tunnel then because there's no guests in the park. Right. But right, you right, go walk right. past Hall of Presidents when they're working on these guys. Oh, my God, it looked like a, a, a slaughter in there. I mean, these guys were all... <laughs> distorted and and bent over and oh it was incredible to see that (laughs) well here's a clip i found online and i i think you might see a familiar face in it so here we go land of them all here in the vacation kingdom of the world (laughs) our first stop as we uh tour the area will be the polynesian village hotel just over there and we'll be going over there just a few moments but first we have a word here from uh mr steve godishelli He'll be your tour guide on most of the journey. I will be your master of ceremony. Steve, would you tell him a little bit about the Polynesian Village Hotel, our Tropic Island Resort? Put away from your master. Oh, no, the Polynesian Village. Those are close. Those are close. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh-oh, our time is up. We're now taking you to one of our monorail platforms. Here's Monorail Black. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, we have Steve Case as he exits the Monorail Black, one of the newer monorails of the Walt Disney World AWIG <laughs> monorail system. <laughs> Uh, Steve is a real maggot. Uh, <laughs> he's been with us two years now. Uh, what we're trying to do is get some shots of people acting natural. It's very hard because these monorail people have had months of mental training and physical training, and it's hard for them to act natural when they are on the job. <laughs> <laughs> that was you, Steve. Do you remember that? I do. Dan O'Keefe, uh, a friend of us all, uh, was very uh, progressive. And he had one of the very first eight millimeter voice recorded uh, films. And he came out and he spent the day riding the trains on his day off, taking those pictures. And it, there's a whole movie of that. Yeah. I want to see the whole thing. I just found a clip of it. I was like, who took this? It's a great. <laughs> I'm not sure who has a copy of it. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Chuck Lane. I believe he put that on youtube at one time he may still have a copy of it so i'll look for it but it was so it's so adorable I, I love seeing you in your your uniform your, i was like oh look there he is <laughs> i had long hair at the time too i had it tucked under my helmet right bruce <laughs> uh, i don't i don't remember that steve uh, yeah that was uh, no you only invited half the management of the whole company i know, you know? I know. <laughs> I still, don't, I still don't know who told on me, though. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Her- Harold East and I were were sporting long hair under our helmet, and we'd shave around our ears and stuff, and it looked like we had worms a lot of the times. But, uh, you know, we would <laughs> cover our hair up, and then um, we were going out to the parking lot one day, and I believe that's when you saw us. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Guilty. And then the next day when we came I in. I couldn't hardly wait. Couldn't sleep that night. I said, <laughs> oh, I got, I got this guy. I got Steve. Finally got Steve. Yeah, you got yeah. me. And uh, Go ahead. We were, and what we happened? Warned. I, Bruce Fox wants to see you in MO8 immediately. I said, I know what this is about. <laughs> so I went to the Main Street Barber and, and Hal East went to the a uh, tunnel barber, and we got our hair cut. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I got upstairs. Me. I said, I got him. I said, all right, sit down, guys. You know why you're here? Uh, no, I have no idea. Huh? Yeah, no. He knew what I was there for. <laughs> I said, well, why don't you take your hat off and relax? And then he <laughs> did, and I said, well, son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I, and then, you guys are no fun at all. <laughs> no, that was, that. I, you know, what did, what did it indicate? That's the kind of people that worked out there at that time i mean it was it was it was a good team uh, you know the fact is everybody worked in together as a team and it was just uh couldn't beat it it was just a great time i hope everybody else enjoyed as much as i did 
Yeah. Yeah. There was there was definitely a Disney look. Uh, I don't think there's a a Disney look now. Things Not anymore. Have changed drastic, <laughs> uh, drastically over the last uh, few years. And but you, you know, over the years, you guys get to see each other as Tom, as you were saying. So here's here's a photo you sent over uh, of of you. Uh, with uh, Robert and, and Ted. And and also, uh, I always suggest, uh, I love a good book. And Tom has a wonderful book, you know, from Disneyland, Tom Sawyer to Disney Legend. So you can find a copy in Amazon and the link is in the show notes below. But overall, if you guys could give one word to describe your experience working on the Walt Disney World monorail, being a part of the opening team almost, you know, 50 years ago, what would that word be? And I'll have Tom start for us. Uh, experience. Uh, it, it, you, you learn so much uh, every day uh, from all the people involved and the, uh, the opening crew uh, was, was just uh, the easiest group in the world to train. Uh, six months later, they all wanted to know why they weren't in management, but you know, uh, <laughs> comes in, comes off. But uh, yeah, the, the experience of going through uh, an opening, and if you ever have that opportunity, uh, jump on it. Bob, what about you? Uh, it was an often awesome experience, and it was a privilege to be a part of it. Uh, it's something that, you know, you can't go through something like that every day, and I'm so glad and pleased that I got to be part of it. Yeah, I'll go next. I'd, I'd say just the greatest opportunity I had. I, 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 I changed fields and witnessed something uh, dealing with, with, with employees and, and guests. I mean, it, you, you can't beat it. I mean, what are you there for? To make people happy. Boy, that's a tough job. No, not at all. That's a great job. And I appreciate it. Um, my time was magical. Some of it was tragic. But most of it was magic, and I wouldn't. But trade we won't it for talk anything. about the tragic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes back to when we used to do live spills before they got recordings. You got to be careful what you say. <laughs> oh no! Oh no, Steve! Oh gosh! Well, Steve C, why don't you give us a, and don't say the word barber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was saved by the hair in my chinny chin chin that day. But, uh, you know, you I you take a redneck from Winter Haven. I grew up in Winter Haven and you put me in this environment. And I just could not believe how lucky I was to be surrounded by all of these wonderful people and all of the uh, experiences of driving a monorail. You know, I I was stuck in Winter Haven. I could have still been there. <laughs> so. It was great. It was really great. And finally, Ted. Well, I'd say memorable, lifetime experience. And you know what? What I learned at Disney was uh, something that stuck with me and useful in my 45 years of teaching, dealing with parents, having the right to attitude, smiling a lot. I mean, it, it translated into a practical, practical lifetime tools. So... Definitely memorable. Yeah, Tammy, if I can add, uh, you notice that everybody here is an introvert. You know, nobody in this group is an extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. You guys are all so sweet to be a part of the show this evening. Um, what I want to actually, I'm going to start with you guys. You're going to be my first reunion. I want to do a Kodak moment. So I want us all to look into the camera, give a big smile because we're all together. So on the count of three, big smiles, everybody. One, two, three. <laughs> Kodak moment. Yeah. Making a memory. Yay. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this reunion. You know, I, I always, I always wanted to be as a kid, I was always like, I want to be somebody who was a monorail driver. And now kids these days get the little sticker or well, they used to, right. They used to get these little stickers yeah. and, and that type of thing. But just to hear these stories from the, the, the originators is amazing. <laughs> so thank you all for being a part of this, this evening. This was such a blast. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Hey, Tom, Enjoy. I appreciate you inviting us over to uh, 
the bar to get a drink after this. That's that's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so we'd be the tiki bar, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the next time we do this, I'll tell you the night we lost Lauren Swell. Oh. That's a good story. Oh, I'm gonna be on edge, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you will. Yeah, he went to the shop, didn't he? Yeah, you took him to the shop. <laughs> <laughs> it took Lawrence and his whole entourage to the monorail shop. Gary Tuttle was in charge of this crew. And uh, <laughs> what happened was the guy at the shop calls up and says, Hey, you gomers have not did it again. You sent people to the shop. And we said, Oh, gee, why? Well, we're in big trouble, I guess. He says, Well, not with this group. He said, They don't even realize what's going on. They've been overserved. <laughs> <laughs> he said they were laughing and just having a ball. And so Aww. I said, I said, well, what we'll do, I'll get a van down there right away. And you put them in the van. And he said, well, what if they start asking questions? I said, well, just tell them this is a new program we're starting for VIPs from Hollywood. <laughs> and never heard another word about it. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Nappy heard about it. Uh oh. He's now looking he at is. me. Look at him. He's, He's mad got... now. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys all for joining us this evening. And thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. I'm so glad you joined us. If you want to see more interviews and reunions live conversations, please subscribe to my channel and share all your this conversation with all of your friends on social media. Um, you could follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Tammy Tucky, on Facebook at facebook.com slash singer Tammy Tucky. And you could find out more of the interviews I've done in the past, including my new album, Glowing in Timeless Places, which is all Disney World themed cover songs that you might like and enjoy on my website at TammyTucky.com. So uh, thanks again to all of you for being a part of the show. And uh, please stand clear of the doors, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening, you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.